You are listening to WTUZ Radio Podcast. Welcome to WTUZ Radio Podcast. Okay, so the inspiration for this particular podcast came from uh, the gentleman. I just know him by his Facebook page, Knowledge of Self. I will drop uh, a link to his Facebook page in the description. I know some people have problems finding it. Uh, He puts out wonderful work. I do know he's working on a book as well. I'm looking forward to that. So he dropped this information with this source, a Jacobite gleaning from state manuscripts, short sketches of Jacobites, the transportation in 1745. So in this particular body of work, which we're going to go through in this podcast, It is basically giving proof that the Jacobites were black, a.k.a. melanated, okay? So that was the inspiration for this particular podcast, but I had to go and get the book for myself, and as I started reading through it, I'm like, oh my God, it gave so much, 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 much more insight that it's unreal. Uh, So we're going to go through that. So let's back up a little bit and go into what, uh, who are the Jacobites? What is this all about? For those that are not familiar with it. um, So we're just going to use the quick source, Jacobedia, Wikipedia, Jacobedia, (laughs) Wikipedia. So this is the Jacobite rising of 1745, also known as the 45 Rebellion, or simply the 45. Um, So it's saying, was an attempt by Charles Edward Stewart to regain the British throne from his father, James Francis Edward Stewart. Okay, now remember when we went over the Stewarts, uh, the Stewarts were melanated, right? But, It took place during the War of the Austrian Succession when the bulk of the British Army was fighting in mainland Europe and provided, I'm sorry, and proved to be the last in the series of revolts that began in 1689 with major outbreaks in 1708, 1715, 1719. Charles launched a rebellion on uh, August 19, 1745 at Glenfinnan in Scotland, High, uh, in the Highlands, capturing Edinburgh and winning the Battle of Preston Pan in September. At a council in October, the Scots agreed to invade England after Charles assured them of any substantial assured them of substantial support from English Jacobites and a simultaneous French landing in southern England. On that basis, the Jacobite army entered England in early November, reaching Derby on October 4th, where they decided to turn back. Okay, so I'm not going to go into any more of the uh, specifics of this particular uh, Jacobite rising. I just wanted to give you all a, uh, for those of you who were not familiar of what the Jacobite rising was all about and, you know, just a little bit of view of who was involved. Okay, but the main purpose of this particular podcast, we're going to go into... Um, the identity of the Jacobites and a lot of other gems are dropped in this. Um, So uh, let's get to it. So let me put this back up for the fam. All right. Okay. So let me get going here. So I'm on page two of Jacobite gleaning from state manuscript. Short Sketches of Jacobites, The Transportation in 1745 by Macbeth Forbes. All right, and even that name, Macbeth, 
I'll take you all on a little reminiscences in a minute. We'll get there because those that are following these podcast series, when you see that Mac, you should already understand the origins of that surname. But let's get to it. So, uh, Gleam, Gleam, Gleam and McFerguson, I'm sorry, Gleam and Mr. Ferguson engaged all day in drawing petitions. These documents with their personal confessions by prisoners throw an interior light on the motives which led the latter to join the rebellion, as well as the current of their connection with it. While many persons were forced to enlist under the prince's banners, not a few asked to be commandeered so that they might have in reserve the plea of compulsion. And thus, what each class had to face was the question, did you do your best to escape at the first opportunity? There is no doubt that in these petitions, there was much of what is pop popularly known as hard swearing, with a view to mitigate the sentences passed on the accused. So what uh, they're kind of describing here are the rebels that uh, were pretty much arrested, okay? So they're being, of course, dragged into court, this, that, and the third. And, you know, they're in court, so they got to give details on how did you get involved, this, that, and the other. And those, that, those rebels that were dragged into court or whatever are um, putting their you know, spin on what really happened, okay? And I shouldn't say spin, because, child, I don't know whether or not they was telling the truth or not, but that's what it was about. They're being dragged in, the rebels, so the Jacobite rebels that were captured were being uh, tried in court, okay? So that's what they're uh, describing here. All right, so in other words, they're saying, were you forced into being a um, Jacobite rebel? All right, ages were frequently underestimated so as to form the groundwork of a petition for mercy on the score of youth. Then the plea of humanity to the royalists, wounded and prisoners, was often timbered and as a rule with success, all right? So that's two strategies for these accused Jacobite rebels to get lighter sentences. So one was, hey, you know what? I was a youngin. And the second is I'm being loyal to the quote, quote, royals. There were Jacobites who would spawn to sue for mercy themselves, as this would, as this would be to acknowledge the ruling sovereign, and such prisoners never looked for pardon. These are the true heroes of the rebellion, but they are not so numerous as may be imagined. Okay, so in other words, you had those that was trying to take a plea. All right, so in other words. You know, give me a lighter sentence, give me a plea bargain because I was young or I was forced into it or I was being loyal. And then you hit the hardcore ones that was like, uh, look, I don't care about none of that. You don't have no right to even drag me up in here for this because I'm sovereign. Right. And what they're saying is those that came in saying they were sovereign. They not trying to hear this mess. They're trying to charge them with. They had a right to do what they did. They had a right to rebel. There was less of them than those trying to take a plea. All right. So, and all had, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 I'm right. And all had the human side in view. Had they not wives, sisters, daughters, lovers, friends from whom they would Fain not to be separated. So, of course, they're saying, you know, trying to get light, lighter sentences. So the Jacobites the, or the Jacobite rebels trying to get light, lighter sentence, sentences use the following. Uh, of course, 
I was young. The other one was I was being loyal to the Royals. And then the hardcore true ones that weren't trying to take a plea was like, listen, I'm sovereign in the first place. I did what I did and I said what I said. They were not looking for a plea and it was less of them. And then, uh, of course, they threw in there folks were that were trying to take a plea was saying, you know, I don't want to be separated from my family. All right. So, Dr. Sa and just note, we're skipping around in this particular state manuscript. We're just highlighting the parts um, that I felt were relevant, but I highly recommend you to uh, read through the entire thing. It's really, really an easy read, and it's a lot of it's a lot of hard hitting information in here, which we're going to go over a lot of it that I, I felt needed to be highlighted. Okay, so Dr. Samuel Johnson was in his 35th year at the time of the rebellion, but his biographer is not able to say much as to his attitude towards it. Apparently, the great lexographer was busy with his notes on Shakespeare and was at the time little known to fame. He published in 1745 a pamphlet on Macbeth, which Warburton eulogized and in regards to which Johnson said, he praised me at a time when praise was of value to me. Johnson, however, had certain Jacobite leanings, and it is told of him that dining one day in 1763 at Old McLangston, where the latter's niece was on one of the company, he took her by the hand and said, my dear, I hope you are a Jacobite. The old gentleman asked Johnson with great warmth what he could mean by putting such a question to his niece. Why, sir, said Johnson, I meant no offense to your niece. I meant her a great compliment. A Jacobite, sir, believes in the divine rights of kings. He that believes in the divine rights of kings believe in a divinity. A Jacobite believes in the divine right of bishops. He that believes in the divine right of bishops believe in the divine authority of the Christian religion. All right, so... Let's continue. All right. So just giving an account of um, kind of the mindset of some of the Jacobites. Right. And also uh, don't think that that slipped past me that Samuel Johnson was um, the artist that was uh, doing a well on the Shakespeare stuff. So don't think that slipped past me either. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go on to uh, on Friday, 19th, September 1777. Dr. Johnson and Boswell set out in a friend's chassis for Derby by the way of Lord Scarsdale seat at Kettlestone with this many objects of interest. Um, all right, so I need to my driving fast in the a chassis, whatever the case. All right, so leaving this amorous flight of the good doctor um, with his saving clause, we pass to a more relevant remark on the parts of his biographer who thus addressed him. I observed that we were this day to stop where the Highland Army did in 1745. Johnson, it was a noble attempt. Okay, so that's Johnson saying it was a noble attempt. Boswell said, I wish we could have an authentic history of it. Johnson said, if you were not an idle dog, <laughs> you might write it. By collecting from everybody what they can tell and putting down your authorities. <laughs> so I have to chuckle. But dang, uh, Johnson, you didn't even have, <laughs> you just call a boy a straight up lazy dog. But all joking aside, I, this really stood out to me 
that they're saying somebody needs to document this Jacobite rebellion. Okay. So that's why it's important when we're doing research on this stuff to get eyewitness accounts of stuff during that time frame. Okay. So I found that very, very interesting. And then it also proves yet again, the others that are bringing this research forward, how this stuff was documented. All right, so let's continue. Boswell, however, learning that John Holm was preparing an account of what that interesting warfare uh, destined from the attempt. It is well that he did so as history is not now compiled from conversation so much as from authentic documents, either in state or private possessions. So did y'all catch that? It is well that he did so as history is not now compiled from conversations so much as from authentic documents either in state or, or in private possessions. So in other words, what they're saying is we need those eyewitness accounts of what went on in the Jacobite rebellion because if we don't get those eyewitness accounts, people that was actually involved or their family members that could give firsthand testimony on what went on, all we're going to have to be able to rely on for this part of history are state papers and other records that are in people's private possessions, right? So I want us to just real quick think about how history is told today, okay? It's gotten so watered down that people don't even use the records. They're not even using the records. What they're using is, quote, quote, academia, which is heavily, heavily slanted, okay? So those that are into research and that are saying, no, that historical event is not the way they say it is. And here's the reason why when they present to folks records, yeah, uh, uh, records, i.e. sources, uh, when they present the records, when they go back and get these manuscripts from eyewitness accounts, Folks are still in denial, all right? So I found that very, very interesting that, again, they're saying this needs to be documented. All right, so um, there are many who have aimed at writing a complete history of the rebellion. This will only be possible when all the public records bearing thereon have been duly classified and arrange and made accessible to the students of those times. Now, let me tell you something. 1745, they're saying, uh, Boswell is saying, I need them receipts. Okay? I need the receipts. So, when the public records have been classified in a range and made accessible. In his political essays, Dr. Johnson incidentally cast a light on the public feelings during the rebellion period. After remarking that Cape Britain, the most important fortress in America, uh, or it could be Breton, um, in America had been taken by Pepperell with the assistance of the fleet, he added, 
we pleased ourselves so much with the acquisition that we could not think of restoring it. And among other arguments used to inflame the people against Charles Stewart, it was very clamorously urged that if he gained the kingdom, he would give Cape Breton or Breton back to the French. The doctor then pointed out that the French had a more easy expedient to regain Cape Breton than by exalting Charles Stuart to the English throne. They took in their turn Fort St. George in the East Indies and got back Cape. I don't know if that's Breton or Breton in exchange. Okay, so we should already know what area uh, this happened at. Uh, this is what we call a day, uh, the Caribbeans. All right. How did King George view this bold attempt to wrest his throne from him? It undoubtedly alarmed his government, especially when the march into England was well on its way. The means of getting intelligence were then few and slight, and the unknown added terror. The Battle of Falkirk fought when the Highlanders were in full hurried retreat, appalled the court. All right. So now let's get into the prisoners, all right? So I just wanted to give you all some insight into, number one, what the whole uh, Jacobite rebellion was about, okay? So let's be clear, it was still family fighting. So the stewards fighting the stewards, okay? So <clears throat> one steward wanting to be back on the throne, and let me just go back to that just, just real quick. All right, so it was uh, was an attempt by Charles Edward Stewart to regain the British throne from his father, James Edward Stewart. Okay, so this was a steward on steward. Okay, all right, so that's what the Jacobite Rebellion was about. All right, and then we see where uh, these two gentlemen, uh, Johnson and Boswell, were talking about how this particular rebellion needed to be documented. Okay, and then the last little part we ended up with, well, how did uh, Charles feel about it? And, you know, he was kind of scoping out, well, if I, you know, do this. So in other words, it seemed like he was trying to cut a deal with the French, okay, to get back on the throne, okay? Uh, but let's continue. All right, so now we're going to get into the prisoners, Passing from these topics to some of the actors in the great drama of the rebellion, which as a military spectacle lasted only 10 months, but the effects of which remain with us until this day, we select Sir David Murray, Bart of Stanhope, as a fair specimen of the titled prisoners of the rebellion. He was a youth of only 16 years when he attached himself to the Jacobite party. Being much thought of by Prince Charles, okay, so y'all peep game at Prince Charles that y'all, you know, see today over in Britain. Uh, Blood's name, that Charles' name is after the melanated uh King Charles. Okay, but let's continue. Being much thought of by Prince Charles, he was chosen to be one of the latter's aides de camp. Though so young, he held the rank of captain, whose regimental headgear was a fur cap. He appears to have freely requisitioned horses and arms for which he gave receipts. Okay, so then they go into, you know, the specific receipts of what blood, young blood <laughs> got. All right, so David Murray, uh, 16. All right, so now we're going to just go into some of the prisoners and just give a high-level description of who they were. Um... So you could get kind of a feel for 
what the army made, uh, you know, the men that the army made up of. All right. So what is the sin? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The state records tell how he came to be captured. Two custom officers received information that there was in the house of a Catholic named Simpson a mile from Whitby, a person waiting for a passenger, I'm sorry, a passage abroad. They accordingly went and searched the house, but found that Sir David, for it was he, had quitted his bed and escaped into the hedge in a field close by. So he was on the run, basically. Here he turned at bay, drew his pen knife, and ran very fiercely up to the officers, but before he could close with them, he was knocked down with a cane and secured. Okay. He said that if he had his pistols, he would have shot them both. He was in disguise and was about to board a vessel at Whitby, which had been hired to take him to Holland. Tried and sentenced, he was pardoned in August 1748 on condition of not returning to the kingdom. So in other words, he was banished. In December of that same year, being attached to Prince Charles, uh, he was arrested in Paris along with his master and put into confinement till they were all conducted out of France, all right? So... He, a uh, child, they, they some mess. Okay, so they got kicked out of friends too. James Stormont of Piscandley, sorry y'all, my UK <sighs> brothers and sisters. Uh, I know that's uh, part of my bloodline on that English side, but y'all, I don't know all these places. <laughs> I'm still an American, <laughs> but I know I'm butchering these places from a pronunciation standpoint. All right. A small lordship next near Forfar was reprieved on the same conditions. The official account of Pitch Candley's is that he was born in the county of uh, Forfar. He was in England with the rebels in no capacity as an officer, but along with Lord Ogilvy's regiment. Okay, so I want y'all to peep game on these names. Lord Ogilvy. Hmm. We know that shows up. That name shows up in the Americas as well. All right. About the beginnings of October 1745, he received a letter from Lord Ogilvy requiring him to come and join him, which he did. It was stated in his favor that he had hid from the rebels, that he had surrendered, and that he had a wife and nine children dependent on him. Adam Hay and Aslid, John Burnett and Francis Farcarkson of Monterel, Mont, Monterey were pardoned on the same terms. Okay, so they basically took a plea saying, listen, I, I have babies. I can't be locked up. Um, who going to take care of my family? Right? And in their particular cases, they got pardoned. All right. So the Honorable William Murray, brother of Lord Dunmar, and for some time a prisoner in the Tower of London, was confined for life in... Carishbrook Castle, Isle of Wight. Dang, so he got a life sentence. Sir James Kinlock, Bart of Kinlock, was immured on August 8, 1746, along with his two brothers, Charles and Alexander, in a room of the New Gaul, Southwark, where his friend, Sir John Weddleburn, Bart, I'm, I don't know if that's Bartholomew, but all right, Rhonda, just leave it alone at Bart. Also was when Mr. Sharp, solicitor to the treasurer, came to examine them. Both of these baronets stated 
where they were born, but refused, as it appears many others also did, to give any further an answers to interrogations. Okay, so they wasn't snitching, basically. If the Crown wanted information, it must get it elsewhere, was in fact, uh, was their reply. The Reverend James Gow, minister of Cargill, a Perthshire, wrote in Sir James Kinlock's favor. Sir James did not wish to go abroad. Pay attention. Sir James did not wish to go abroad after being reprieved, but preferred to find bail here. He was accordingly compelled to stay in a place in the country fixed by his majesty. So in other words, uh, old boy was like, and I don't want to be shipped overseas. Just go on and let me um, get bail, bruh. Certificates of character were not always efficacious. Sir John Wittenburn Bart already alluded to who was officially described as a volunteer in Lord Ogilvy's regiment and a collector of ex I don't know if this exercise or excise for the rebels at Perth was one of the early victims of the rebellion. After a six hour trial at St. Margaret's Hill, he was found guilty and con condemned to death. In vain did his parish minister transmit a memorial to the authorities on his behalf and state therein that Sir John had a wife and eight children, they would probably reply that he should have counted the cost. Child. So old boy was trying to get out of pretty much a death sentence. By saying, you know, hey, I got babies and a family to take care of. And child, they weren't trying to hear that. They basically saying, you should have thought about that before you did what you did. All right. So that's just um, a couple of accounts. I just picked out two of uh, kind of the prisoners and um, their sentences. So you saw you had a youngin. In the previous uh, chapter and in this chapter, you had men with families. Uh, you had some that was taking pleas and some that was like, you ain't finna get no information up out of me. And some saying, I don't even know why you dragging me in here in the first place. I'm sovereign. Um, and then, you know, some just looking to take pleas. So you saw uh, some that were um, banished. So meaning they were never to, they could never to return to the land. And, um, you know, the one guy was like, I don't want to go over there. Come on and give me bail. Uh, I don't, I don't want to be shipped overseas. Give me bail. And then also you had people that were put to death. Okay. So again, this is the prisoners again. This is chapter three. All right. Donald Mem Donald McDonald or Donald M. Donald of Terradrish was a major in Kepak's regiment. It was officially stated that he gave no quarter to the Royalists at Prestapan, and that when the Duke of Perth came riding up to him and said, Major, I am sorry to see so much English blood in split. For God's sake, give the men quarter. He His answer was, my Lord, if we do not take them out here, we shall have to do it in another place, for they won't stay with us. It is only fair to say that all accounts of the major's character belied the brutality and put it to him by the crown's authority. Such a story was, of course, fatal to his obtaining pardon. The major made an effort to escape from Carlisle Cass by bribing the guard, but the attempt was discovered after he fled off his fetters. Now, I picked out Donald, and it says M. Donald, but I always think of McDonald, 
of Turnadresh Major, let me back that up, Major M. Donnell for a purpose. Let me refresh the fam's memory of that name, of that McDonald's name, that McDonald name. Let's hit it. So, this is from the Negro rulers of Scotland and the British Isle. All right? This is part of the series we're doing on, um, you know, the black nobility rulers. Okay? And pretty much we're going through their lineage. All right? This is why it's important, fam, that you pay attention to surnames, that you understand the origins of those surnames. When I say the origins, what country, nation those surnames came from, okay? The families linked to those surnames. And you can pretty much narrow in on where those surnames went around the world, okay? So those of us in the Americas carrying these surnames, all right? Again, carrying these European surnames, you're not getting those surnames from slave masters. These surnames were from Black Europeans, okay? That is why it's important for you to do your genealogy. And when you hit a roadblock in your genealogy, when you can't find that one relative, I highly, highly, highly encourage you, start looking at ship manifests. Start looking at immigration records, okay? All right, so let's get on this Donald or McDonald's name, okay? This particular bloodline with that Donald name started with Kenneth McAlpine, today known as McAlpine, the Niger, okay? So the Christian converted Moorish, Moorish Pitts. Because today this is Pitts, but Pittish. Kenneth McAlpine, who was also called Niger Valdub, Dub is black, was the first king of Scottish Alpine dynasty. The Scottish archaeologist David McRitchie stressed that Alpine, or Alpine today, the father of Kenneth McAlpine was a half black pike and a half-black Scot, whose son, Kenneth, was the first to merge the first, I'm sorry, was the first to merge two foremost branches of the blacks in Scotland. Okay? So this was all the way in A.D. 843. Okay? So let's get down to some of these names associated with the bloodline of the McAlpines. All right, so, um, da-da-da-da-da. Okay, so we're saying after the death of King Edith, or Edith, his nephew and cousin Gregory succeeded the throne and ruled jointly following uh, them was cousin Donald II, son of Moorish Constantine I. Uh, after the death of Donald II, his cousin Constantine, la, 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 la. So I'm just giving you where this, this Donald surname is coming from. Every king and the Mac, okay? So now you should understand that surname Donald, where it's coming from, it's coming from King Donald. You should understand when you see a Mac that is associated with Mac Alpine or Mac Alpine or Kenneth Mac Alpine who was a Moorish Pitts king who was half 
white and half Scott, black, let's be clear, black, who merged or brought together the black Scottish kingdom. All right? So every king, right? It didn't say some. It didn't say maybe. Every king who followed who followed Kenneth McAlpine was of Moorish de- descent. McAlpine's descendant, Kenneth Dub, Niger Duff or Duff, Duffy. So when you see Dub, that's associated with Niger Duff or Duffy. Dub means black. And all of his successors were called the son of the black. All right. The four most popular African Moorish kings to rule Scotland were Kenneth McAlpine or Penn, Niger Valdub, Kenneth the Niger, Macbeth. Okay, so who's putting together this memoir? Ain't that a Macbeth? All right. So, um, and James. And King James, they went on to become the first African Moorish Scotland kings of England. All rulers of Scotland, 17th century, la, 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 okay? So I just wanted to show you, here's Donald, okay? So Donald, in this particular Jacobite rebellion, Donald M. Donald, Major Donald M. Donald. Okay. Appears to me this is in the bloodline of the Max or the Mac Al- Alpines. So Donald the First was a Negro Pittish King Donald the First, the youngest brother and successor of Kenneth McAlpine or at McAlpine. Okay. So I'm just bringing it up to show you it's not a coincidence that you have these same folks or these people that's fighting in these different wars. And in this particular case, this rebellion, they have ties to these kingdoms. Okay? So remember, this Jacobite rebellion is about Steward on steward, right? Let's be clear. Is it not the steward, James Stewart? They're part of the McAlpins bloodline. They were fit into that rulership. Okay. And now here you have again um someone with the surname of Donald, not only the surname, a major, with the surname of um, MacDonald being all up in the mix. Okay. All right. So let's continue. So again, I skipped around to the highlights on this. (laughs) But I highly encourage you to... um, Read it for yourself. Um, it's very, very good stuff. And not only that, it um, it's an easy read. It's a very easy read. Okay, so just to, just to call out, fam, on um, page sixteen of this, I I always see in passing people talking about that Walker surname. Um, the Walker surname also shows up in um the the documenting of um the the Jacobites, okay? So that Walker surname also ties back to to Europe. Okay. So, let's get it going. Let's see. We're on page 17 now. So, Get back to this. Do, 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 All right. Archibald Stewart, a rebel soldier who had been a servant to the Duke of Perth, 
for 10 years, obtained pardon through his humanity to the wounded. He saved the life of Major Bowles at the Battle of Preston Pan, and the major story, along with other affidavits in Stewart's favor, throws light on the manner in which the royalists wounded Fard after that decisive fight. The major, who was a gen- who was in General Hamilton's regiment at the battle, thus wrote to his brother. I want y'all to pay attention to these surnames. You see these same surnames. Not only, you know, a lot of us carry these surnames. I mean, heck, early up in the book, you got a Johnson up in the mix. <laughs> My surname. Being told, you need to get up off your butt and and document this. Okay? So now you have a steward who had to be pardoned. Okay? And so they're giving the reason on how he got pardoned. So it's saying, thrown thrown light on the manner in which the royalists wounded Fard after the uh, decisive fight. The major, who was in General Hamilton's peep game, General Hamilton's, okay, Hamilton, a melanated man, okay, over in America, when I'm talking over in America, but I want y'all to peep game to these surnames over in Europe as well, okay? So you could go check out uh, Kui Mayo did a drop on Hamilton being melanated. Um, go check out his YouTube channel. Check out uh, Legendary Top Cats YouTube channel did a drop on Hamilton being melanated. Okay. And Peep Game, that play that became very famous in the Americas called Hamilton was giving you game right in front of your face with Hamilton and them being melanated. Okay? They had Thomas Jefferson up in there, melanated. The only one that they didn't have melanated was King George, which we know he was melanated as well. Okay? So I want y'all to pay attention to these surnames because you need to understand that those surnames that you carry today are not Slave master surnames, as far as your family being enslaved via a white man. They're not white people's surnames. All right, so the major who was in General Hamilton's regiment at the battle thus wrote to his brother, Mr. William Bowles, MP, Mark Lane, London, on Stewart's behalf. I gladly embrace the opportunity of endeavoring to show my gratitude to a man who undoubtedly was more than instrumental in saving my life, for he not only supported me with a strong arm when I was fainting and almost dying with the great loss of blood, which ran from 11 wounds, but also preserved from me being cut to pieces by the straggling, (coughs) excuse me, Highlanders, which in all probability would have been my fate if he had not been for his care and protection. Stewart was also helpful to General Sir John Cope's principal servant and to his coachmen who were taken at the same battle. He got free passes for both of these men by means which they were restored to liberty. So this what I put in a little note, y'all. So the steward got pardoned, basically, huh? That's what that that's that's what they're saying up in here. Sips tea. So Archibald Stewart, he got pardoned because, you know, according to General uh to Major, let me make sure I don't want to lie on people. Let me get it right, Rand uh, Rhonda. So Archibald Stewart was pardoned. By an officer. And you know they were up under General Hamilton's regime. He got pardoned based on him basically saving one of the officer's lives. Life. 
So, you know, me, I'm saying, did he really get pardoned because he was a steward? You know, King James, them peeps, that steward? Hmm. I'm just saying, okay? Because everybody else had to do a lot of explaining. You know what I'm saying? Talk about their baby mamas, uh, they, they children. You know, I was bullied into doing it, this, that, and the third. But uh, this steward, oh, your pardon. Oh, because XYZ said that you did one, two, three. You're pardoned. Mm, okay, then. No, this was this was about a bloodline because. This person is of the bloodline, the steward bloodline, okay? And it's interesting. Remember, it said he was also a servant of the Duke of Perth. But he still got that pardon. So it was saying that somebody else, now this would trip me out, y'all. Pay attention. <laughs> And we're going to circle back. I'm going to have to circle back because I'm still not done with this information and dig a little deeper into these particular officers because, child, these surnames tripping me out. So Lieutenant David Drummond of Colonel Lee's, Colonel Lee's regiment also wrote in Stewart's favor, Sips T. Now... I got to dig up the receipts on this. This is where my mind is going. Now, when I think of Colonel Lee, I think of them Lee boys. In America, in America, that fought in the Civil War. Okay? You know, Robert E. Lee. You know, Black... Robert E. Lee, uh-huh, yeah, who daddy was black and that was in the military. Now, see, I ain't want to gossip. I got to get the receipts on this if this is that same Lee bloodline. I'm going to circle back and try to find the receipts on this, okay? So, there's that part. So here you have a steward had an officer step up and said, yeah, you know, Archibald Stewart, oh boy, saved my life, this, that, and the third. And now you have Lieutenant. Now, oh, oh, and remember that particular officer was up under Hamilton, up under Hamilton's regime. Now you have another officer stepping up who's under Colonel Lee's regiment. Child, uh, child, I'm going to circle back on that fam. Got a little bit more digging to do. Okay. All right. So um, let me see what else. Do, 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 do. All right. That's all I wanted on that. So the steward got a pardon. It should be no surprise to us on that. Okay. Seemed like they had, as the steward had some heavy connections. And it really appears, I'm going to dig up the receipts the best I can, that these are the same bloodlines that we see over here in the Americas with these last names of the Hamiltons, the Lees. We know for sure the Stewards. These are all the same folks, okay? All right? Because as, as we go through this work, you're going to see even more why I'm trying to make that connection. But I, I'm going to try to find some receipts also on it. All right, so we're at the transportation in 1745. So, all right, so this is given an account of uh, prisoners early in the morning. The transportation in 1745. Prisoners early in the morning of May 25th, 1746, put on board the shark, sloop of war, 
Um, okay. So I'm only highlighting that to just show you that they, they kept records, fam. They kept records. And this is why it's important when you're doing your research, you're doing your genealogy, you get stuck. Go check the immigration records. Go check the immigration records. They even have, I think it's either, is it convict? I think it's convict records. I forget the, the exact name of it. But it's there. Go check and see if your people are on that stuff. All right. Okay. Um, so let me see how much it is. I want to go through. Okay, so I have examined some of the crown witnesses who lived at Thurso and knew that knew the petitioner perfectly well in relation to his behavior during the rebellion. I do not find that he was concerned in any shape, matter. Okay, whatever, whatever. Okay, I was trying to find something else on here. All right, all right, well, that was a reason I didn't highlight it. So let me keep it moving and stick to my highlighted parts. <laughs> all right, so drawing lots as the drawing lots acts as to transportation, abolitionist, and heritable jurisdictions, disarmony of highlanders, escapees in 1716 offered to transport rebels abroad. Okay, so now we're in the transportation section of it. So, in these trying times, the authorities had not substantiate a man's guilt. He had to prove his own innocence before they would set him free from confinement. Should he complain, he had the option presented to him if able body of serving his majesty at home or abroad in the army or navy. Now, I don't even know if they're still doing that today in, in America uh, where some of the young folks that get into trouble, that they have an option of uh, serving a um, jail sentence or going into um, the military. So I found that interesting that th that was, you know, the play back then. Then they were allowed to draw lots who were not distinguished by any degree of guilt and were not men of note. Those fortunate enough to draw the blank lot had to petition for pardon, which they received on condition of transportation. Pay attention. Those fortunate enough to draw the blank lot had to petition for pardon, which they received on condition of transportation to our colonies in America there to serve and remain during the term of their natural lives on the same conditions as laid down in 1715. So remember, we're still talking about the Jacobites, right? We're still talking about the Jacobite rebellion. So they're telling you the other option was you're behind up out of here. Okay. We ain't going to let you go to jail this, that, and the third. You up out of here. You're banished for life. You can't come back. Just like we did in 1715. You're banished to the colonies in America. Transportation is said to have been first invented by the Privy Council in the reign of Charles II. And it became acknowledged form of punishment under the Act of 1701, which defines transportation as a proper legal sentence. Okay, so they are telling you that being exiled from their homeland over, in, uh, over to America was a form of a sentencing. 
Okay, so again, that's why when you're doing your genealogy, you hit that roadblock. You can't find that ancestor. You see that it stopped. You better check them immigration records and check those um, convict uh, ship shipping lists. I forget exactly what it's called, but you better check them because more than likely you're going to find your folks on there. All right. So in the reign of Charles II, the times were such that rebellious were rife and the government could hardly put ever, every rebel to death. Principle and policy alike forbade that. So in other words, they just couldn't go ahead on and just take everybody out. The authorities were as powerless in this respect as Nero, who wished that all Rome had but one head that he might cut it off at a single blow. Sir George Mackenzie, in his vindication of Charles II's II, government, says, as to sending people away to the plantations, none were sent away, but such as were taken at Bothwell Bridge or in the Argyles Rebellion and the turning capital punishment into exile was an act of clemency, not of cruelty. Cromwell deported his royalist prisoners so that it was not confined to one section of the community more than another. As to clemency of transportation, Burton talks of the 700 rebel prisoners taken at Preston and sold as slaves to the West Indies merchants in 1716. Who? Huh? Who? Huh? What? Who? Huh? Who said what now what and when how? Let, let's just read that again. Who was selling uh, rebel rebel prisoners were sold as slaves to the West Indies. To the West Indy merchants. Let me get it right, Rhonda. Get, get it right. To the West Indy merchants in 1716. I thought y'all said that they came from Africa. Ain't, ain't, ain't that what the original narrative is? That they came from Africa? But uh, this is talking about 700 rebel prisoners. Okay. He says, it is painful to see on the list that many Highland names Followed by laborer. This is why, again, when you're doing your genealogy, you run into that roadblock and you thinking that your tree stops there, go to the immigration records and the convict list ship manifest. Okay? It's documented. It is documented. So you see where these prisoners of war, rebels, convicts, it was documented. It is documented them coming over to the Americas. All right? Unlike the millions and millions and millions of African slaves that are not documented. Let me just run that for the slow ones in the back. Because again, we have documentation on these rebels, prisoners of war, convicts, convicts, indentured servants, laborers. We have their ship manifest records. We don't have those millions and millions of African records. Oh, okay. So you mean to tell me 
They documented one, but they didn't document the other. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's continue. All right. So it was, a, he said, it is painful to see on the list the many Highland names followed by laborers. Implicit obedience had been their crime. And in many instances, they had been forced into the service for which they were punished as absolutely as the French conscript or the British pressed seamen. All right. The poor peasantry who followed their chief to the field did so from necessity rather than choice. Okay, so they're giving you gain. So those who, you know, had a leader, their chief, so meaning, let's say uh, the chief and his boys, them, they got all of their behinds up out of there. They were all exiled. So the poor peasantry who followed their chief, so the chief boys, them, they was banished up out of uh, Europe as well and became laborers. They had to live, and when he who gave them employment, they had to live, and when he who gave them employment in time of peace asked a warlike service from them, it was at their own pearl they refused. So let's run that for the slow ones in the back, what they're saying. So they're saying that the chief who had people working for them, so in other words, you know, employer, employee relationship, you know, I'm sure, you know, they were cool, all of that. So when war broke out, the chief was pretty much like, are you fighting on my team or not? So out of obligation and to their best interest, meaning the, the employee or the poor person, they went on and rolled with chief, right? Okay. But when all of, uh, it was said and done when the sentencing broke down, when folks got caught, so meaning uh, the chief them, when they got caught, when that uh, they didn't win that particular war, um, the court didn't want to hear that you was just uh, the chief's employee. Nope, you up out of here too. You might as well go on and get on that ship with him, this, that, and the third. You out of here as well. Agriculture, even in its backwood and undeveloped condition, was at that time the mainstay of Scotland. And landowners could not go to the state then, as they do now, for money to improve their holdings. They had to resort to few banks existing at that time and borrow from the establishment at higher rates and on a personal security, one lard standing as financial sponsor for another. So I found that interesting that they pretty much saying that farmers were back, even back then going to banks to borrow money uh, to run their particular farm. I found that very, very interesting. Okay. All right. Um, there was the, in, in Scotland, a varying but all-round poverty at which the effects were necessarily felt at the one social extreme more than another. All right? So that should be pretty self-explanatory. The great power which the, which the landed proprietors wielded at this time, especially in the northern parts, where they were virtually an imperium, taking the law into their own hands and enforcing their decrees by dagger and broadsword was struck at by the act of, I guess that's 20, which was designed to clip the wings of feudal tyranny and to substitute the regular jurisdiction of the kingdom for the wayward and high-handed procedure of the lords or the lords. This act was passed to abolish what were known as heritable jurisdiction. 
These were henceforth to cease and to be vested in the king's courts and judges. All hereditary sheriffships and jurisdictions heretofore granted to many heritors or proprietors whose land had been erected into baronies or granted with power of pit and gallows, although this power had ceased to be used, were to come to an end. No such barons or other heritors or their valleys were from this time forth to exercise jurisdiction in any criminal case other than assault, robberies, and smaller crimes for which 20 shillings sterlings was the fine or the sentence not exceeding three hours in the stock of the daytime. Nor in civil cases were the debt was greater than 40 shillings sterlings. Own, I'm sorry, the only reservation of jurisdiction to these lords was over coal workers and salt workers who were then little better than serfs. But the power of trying any case involving loss of life or disembarkation was accepted. It is said of the no, notorious Lord Levat that he once to, told Lord President Forbes that he would punish a certain chief for slighting the president as if no tribunal existed to give redress. All right, so I pretty much highlighted that to show y'all how it was a battle going on for the kings, the kingdoms them having rights over uh, heritable, so inherited property or territory, all right? So no different than what was done over here in the Americas when you had the indigenous people and their land and kings or kingdoms over in Europe. So meaning the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, the Eng English coming over here saying, well, I don't, I don't care nothing about that, you know, this land been in your family for this amount of time period. I don't care nothing about this being this particular nation's land, this tribe's land. You don't hold any jurisdiction on that. Um, you know, this now belongs to this particular kingdom. All right. So I just wanted to kind of uh, give you some insight on what was going on back then. Now, whether or not some of this heritable land was still already taken from the indigenous indigenous people of the land. More than likely, yes, it was. So even the ones during this time that's claiming that that was heritable land that was passed down to them from their ancestors does not mean that they are by bloodline indigenous to that land. They could have acquired it some other way. Okay. But I just wanted to give you some insight again, what was going on. And also you should start to understand the patterns of colonization. All right. So the questions was discussed. And I don't know if I said that, I uh, said this in case you get the book and you trying to be like, where are they at? We started on uh, page 38. The question was discussed by the Crown authorities whether the penalty of banishment was sufficient for its purpose, and it will be seen that one prominent official did not regard it so. McPhillip Webb, the prosecuting solicitor, had a plan of his own for branding the prisoners like Herring or deserters as they then did. Writing on the 4th of September, 1746, he said, as to the prisoners that have escaped into the lots, if they are to be transported, you may be assured that most of them will return again in a short time. It happened so in 1716. Suppose a law was made for transporting them and marking them on the face with a hot iron 
and making it a felony if they return without such a mark, every law will be ineffectual. This brutal proposal was happily not entertained by the authorities. So the reason I highlighted that was number one, pointing out again, they're pointing out to you again, that these rebels from the Jacob uh, the Jacobite rebellion were being sentenced to be shipped overseas or to the American colonies. Uh, and it's not the first time they've shipped over uh, people that's been convicted, all right? Because they reference what happened in 1716. So this particular person, uh, Webb, was saying, we need to brand them, okay, with that hot iron. So what came up in my mind immediately was the narrative that they are giving you and the transatlantic slave trade of branding, branding slaves. Hmm. Two acts of parliament with the penalty of transportation were passed. One for disarming the highlands, the other prescribing the highland garb, garb if arms were not delivered up by persons, residents within certain northern limits. Huh. Can we say G-U-N control? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. See, nothing is new, fam. That's why it's important for you not only to know the true history, but it's also important for you to look at the patterns. Okay? So they was tired of them Highlanders uh, with rising up. Okay? And you should understand why the Highlanders were rising up. Because they was coming through, putting debt on the people. Snatching up land, okay? Saying you don't have no jurisdiction over your heritable land and all of that particular jazz. So there was an uprising, okay? So they like, you know what? These people was heavily armed, so we need to snatch them arms from you. All right, so if arms were concealed, a penalty of 15 pounds was extracted, failing which the offender was liable to be transported to America as a common soldier if fit for service, baby. Well, dang, you couldn't even have your arms? And if you got caught with it, you out of there, you going to the Americas. So... Americans, okay? Now, I understand Caucasian Americas, not all of you. We're going to take out the middle class because y'all on some other stuff. But the Caucasians that talk about the right to arm, they always use the argument of... The founding fathers, it's built into the Constitution. They use the argument about having to fight against Britain for their freedom in the Americas. Okay? That is the crutch of the argument to bear arm. Melanated folks. You were a part, your ancestry was a part of these folks who were fighting back up in the day in Europe, okay? Your European ancestry, your black European ancestry was part of that. So I'm saying all that to say it is no coincidence that even to this day in, in the Americas, Americas are not about that G-U-N control. Overwhelmingly, majority of Americans, they like, nah, we're we not going for it. 
It's not a coincidence, okay? All right. And until this, to this day, from my understanding, over in the UK, they don't have arms. It's banned. Okay? All right, so let's continue. So in other words, you get caught with that hammer, you out of here. You going to, uh, to the Americas. For a second offense, the punishment was transportation for seven years. As regard wearing what are termed the highland clothes under which are comprised the plaid, dang, pill bed, trues, shoulder belts, cockade, bonnet, tartan cloth, etc. The uh, penal consequences were imprisonment for six months without bail for the first uh, offense and for the second transportation for seven years. Baby. Well, dang, so now you telling me I can't have my hammer. I'm out of there. So now you fisting to tell me I can't even dress in my tribal, in my tribal get up. So if I do that twice, I get caught in my tribal get up twice. Cause I guess the first time you're going to drag me in and say, okay, well maybe you didn't know, but you can't wear that. Don't be uh, going around here wearing that tribal get up and um nation get up because y'all a bunch of mess starters you always fighting always fighting so i'm gonna let you go on this time so go ahead on with it now now if i drag you back up in here again you out of here meaning they were shipped up out so Episcopalian clergymen refusing to take the earth oath, sorry, oath of allegiance were on a second conviction liable to transportation to the American plantations for life. And if they returned therefrom, the penalty was imprisonment during the term of their natural existence. Baby, they wasn't playing. You understand me? So, uh, Episcopalian preacher, you better go on and, and have your allegiance to this ruling crown. Oh, you say you don't want to do that? Oh, okay. Well, well, you up out of here too. You're going to America. We ain't trying to play with you either. You out of here. Okay, for life. You're out of here for life. You go, you, you and Americans. For life. So that would also make sense why, you know, some of our ancestors, if you have all the way European heritage or you have an admixture of European heritage, which that is me, an admixture, that would explain why the folks did not go back over to Europe. Okay, of course. Probably some of it because they marry with the indigenous people. They got a family over here, this, that, and the third. They weren't going back. But then the other piece was because they couldn't go back. They were banned, right? So um, to the preacher, Nim, and if you brought your raggedy tail back over here, then you we just going to imprison you here. You're going to get a life prison, prison sentence. A law was also passed under which any rebel returning from transportation without liberty was to suffer death as in the case of felony without the benefit of clergy persons aiding anyone to escape would be subject to the same punishment but they would have to be indicted within two years after the offense in order to keep a further check on the transported rebels the commander of the ship in which they were conveyed was compelled under the provisions of the act to furnish a list of their names to the naval 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 officer at the port where they were landed and to hang it from the custom house under the penalty of uh, 50 pounds if this was not done. So in other words, we documenting y'all that uh, getting shipped up out of here. Hence, that is why there are records. And we finna hang this. Uh, list up here on this uh, port, whatever the case may be. 
So any of y'all assisting people up on this ship, on this list, you finna get that work also. Next thing you know, you gonna be on the next ship out. <laughs> Your dog on self. All right. As for the escapees referred to by Mr. Webb, in the earlier rebellion, there was notified to the authorities the arrival at Cove, the port of Cork, on the 27th of August, 1716, of 118 rebels taken at Preston and bound for Virginia. There goes some more rebels being rounded up. You up out of here, blood. You going to Virginia. Okay? And the escaped of some of them. The sheriff of court found three in a tavern with the master of the ship, <laughs> the Anne of Liverpool. Their names were Alexander Murray, Senior and Junior, and Peter Chambers of Edinburgh. And they were reported to be talking treasons in their cup. <laughs> chow, in their cups. So chow, they was in there in, in, the, in the tavern. All right. So, you know, for some of the youngins that don't know taverns, baby, that's a bar. Okay, sweet pea. That's a bar. All right. So they in the bar getting towed up. They, that liquor didn't got into them. Running their little mouth. So apparently somebody was there listening and went snitching. But nonetheless, they was talking into that uh, alcoholic beverage. And they was talking treason. And at least that's what the snitch said. <laughs> another vessel also on its way for Virginia landed at. So remember, another vessel also on its way for Virginia landed at Waterford with rebels who were encouraged to make their escape. The surveyor of Cove detailed the measures taken to recapture those who made off, and he stated that their flight was connived at by some of the officers of the ship. So in other words, the officers of the ship was helping them escape. One of the transported prisoners was said to be Scottish gentlemen in scarlet clothes trimmed with gold worth 700 to 800 pounds a year. So in other words, he was dripping. <laughs> he had some change. So this is just an example telling you, baby, they ain't cared nothing about rich, poor, none of that. You was out of there. You got that sentence, you was out of there. Okay. Okay, in 1716, a Thomas Johnson made a claim on the government for transporting 639 prisoners. So soon as it was known that measure of banishment were uh, mediated, several English merchants pay attention. Several English merchants trading abroad forthwith made offers of the needful transportation. Okay. So where are they getting these workers slash slaves for the colonies? It's two folds. We kept telling, well, three folds. Uh, we kept telling y'all this. The records keep proving this. One source are the indigenous people of the land. Second source, these exile prisoners of war slash convicts from Europe. That's what made up the bulk of the folks working in those colonies slash plantations, whether on some sort of indentured servant contract, Rather on, that's your prison sentence, blood, you up out of here, you can't come back. Rather you are a prisoner of war, this is, you're indigenous to the land. And the very last group, which is the smallest, are the Africans. Okay? And how do we know that? Again, because of the records. 
All right. So, so soon as it was known, the measure of banishment were, uh, yeah, we talked about that. Some Chester traders invoked in September 1746 the interests of the Earl of Cholomandli on their behalf as they had been informed that some of the rebel prisoners in the castle of Chester were to be transported to some port of the West Indies. And they thought it would be less expensive if they were conveyed from that seaport. So again... We're talking folks that were on those plantations. You're talking black European people and the indigenous people themselves of the land. So this transatlantic slave narrative that they're giving you of millions and millions of Africans, which they ain't provided no doggone detail receipts on. They ain't proved that with records the ship manifest records of the millions of the said Africans via the transatlantic slave trade but yet we have records of the Indian wars and we have records of folks being kicked up out of Europe sent over to the American colonies, right? Okay, uh, let's see. So the expense of transporting from Chester had been heretofore $5, uh, not $5, five pounds a piece, besides the cost of conveyance to Liverpool. And if other merchants offered lower terms, they would similarly reduce their rates as one of their avowed objects was introducing here. If they could, the West Indian trade and encouraging our navigation towards the during whereof sending our ships with rebels in a is a step. So again, they was supplying labor on the West Indies from where? Wasn't from no Africans. It was from black Europeans. Black rebel Europeans. Six others had applied, hence the need to be backed up. The present estimate was to transport prisoners to Jamaica or the West Indies at Five pound a head. Okay, so we already did a drop on Jamaican having those surnames, European surnames, and how those European surnames are black European surnames, and that a lot of Jamaicans have European heritage. Okay, so Cromwell and them shipping the Irish. The black Irish to the Indies, a lot of them hit that Jamaica Barbados route. Okay. This Jacobite rebellion was no different. On the 21st of, 24th of March, 1719, Jonathan Forward, Merchant London. Okay, uh, look at all these merchants. Because again, we keep telling you for these folks, it's about business. They came over to the Americas to do business. So everything running all up and through the Americas was about running the men's ultimately back up to the crown. But the merchants, their investors and businessmen, they're in it to make money. Okay? This wasn't about race. Wasn't about a black and white. Because this was really black to black. All right? It was about territory. Profits. 
That's what this was about. Kingdoms feeling they had to the right to take indigenous people of said lands, tangible resources. So meaning the land, precious metals, all of that jazz. They were so cold with it. You go pull some of those American charters and you'll see where they not only authorized to do business, because that's what a charter is. It's the, uh, the authorization to do something. So not only the king them, so because the king is issuing the charters, authorizing business to be done on the America lands, they outline the specific longitude and latitude of the charter and tell what type of commerce can be done on the land, who's going to benefit from the commerce, who's going to manage and run it. Uh, they leave pretty detailed records, okay? They so cold with it, baby, in one of the charters, they said, uh, even a fish up out the sea, you're going to run me my ends. And that's not for some time. That's not for this date and that date. That's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, ever, ever. You're going to run me my ends. You're going to run it back to this empire. And I don't give a dog on if I ain't living. You're going to run it back to my bloodline forever and ever and ever and ever, 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 ever. That's what this is about. They said they don't care if you change the name of it. You can change the seal of it. I don't, none of that is cared for. I am telling you, you're going to run this in, these ends. You have to get authorization to do business on these said conquered territories. All right. So let's continue. All right. So now we're into chapter three. Um, the colonies and plantations, a dumping ground for prisoners, the colonization movement rebels ask for by American governor as soldier transport contract. So let me just go over that again. Because remember the, the narrative that they give you is that the colonies the labor makeup from the colonies was from African slaves, right? Via the transatlantic slave trade. The colonies and plantations, a dumping ground for prisoners. The colonization movement. Rebels ask for, by American governor as soldiers, transport contract. Among the lotted were 180 who had drawn the blank lot at Carlisle's, 72 at York, 73 at Lancaster, 34 at Lincoln, 34 at Chester, and 430 at Tilbury, and in the following transport. On the Thymes, Liberty and Property, James and Mary, Pamela, and the Slope Furnace. So you all understand how this was well documented. These were the figures in September and October 1746, and Captain Erie was instruct, uh, instrumental in getting them all quietly to petition for transportation, for which he was thanked by his grace and Duke of Newcastle. The colonies and plantations had been for some time back the dumping ground for undesirables of all kinds. So let me just run that for the slow ones in the back. Because remember, they told us now, they told us the official narrative that there were millions of African slaves transported via the transatlantic slave trade that was packed in these huge ship as looking like a can of sardines. That's how you got millions. They started with 20 million. 
And now today they didn't chop that story all the way down to 300,000. Okay. But uh, to this day, majority feel that if you are black, melanated, AKA black, AKA Negro, they classified you as African dash American. Your heritage is of slavery and an African slave at that. But yet, remember, this Jacobite gleaming in 1745, and this is just one account, is telling you something totally different. It's, it, it, they're literally saying the colonies and plantations had been for some time back the dumping ground for undesirables of all kinds, convicts, state criminals, whether political or religious, rebels, suspects, malcontents, fanatics, and deserters. Dr. Robert Chambers state that after the restoration of Royal Fishery Company with the capital of 25,000 pounds of sterling, was started as a rival to the Dutch. Remember the Dutch had their little company too that was over here doing business. Rival to the Dutch. And, and, I, and matter of fact, the East Indian Company was kind of um, stood up off of the idea of how the Dutch was running their stuff. Rival to the Dutch. And that amongst the most notable uses for shipping in the reign of the restored steward were privateering against the Dutch and the transporting of poor people to Barbados and discontented West Country Presbyterians to the American colony. So I'm just going to read that back. Let me take a sip of this water. See, I want us to clearly understand let me just go on and read that again. All right. <laughs> so it is saying that, um, oh boy, Chambers stated that after the restoration, a royal fishery company with the capital of 25,000 pounds of silver was started as a rival to the Dutch. And that amongst the most notable uses for shipping in the reign of the restored steward were privateering against the Dutch and the transporting of poor people to Barbados and the discontented West Country Presbyter Presbyterians to the American colonies. He adds an interesting fact that it was not till 11 years after the Union that Scotland sent her first ship across the Atlantic and that in the West, owing to the development of the American colonies, the national progress was greater than in the other parts of Scotland. A valuable publication referring to an earlier century's immigrants and including those whose passengers were assisted by the government of the day, is that John Camden Hotton, London, 1874, entitled Original List of Personal Qualities, Immigrants, Religion, Religious Exiles, Political Rebels, and Others Who Went from Great Britain to the American Plantation. 1600 through 1700. So you want to explain to me again about the transatlantic slave trade. Explain to me that again. When these folks clearly documented, clearly documented that they were shipping out who from Europe Immigrants, so some of them immigrants could have been Africans. I, heck, I don't know. Religious exiles, political rebels, and others who went from where? 
not from Africa, Great Britain to the American plantations, 1600s through the 1700s. These and those who came after them in the 15, so I'm assuming that's 1715, and the 45, yep, and 1745, were among the willing or unwilling pioneers of the colonization movement in which even army deserters had a place. So I'm going to pause, sip some water. I want y'all to noodle on that. You understand what happened. They're telling you that Europe had been shipping the folks that they exiled. You know, them black Europeans had been shipping other black Europeans to the American plantations since the 1600s. Okay? Not from Africa. From Europe. All right? So that means black Europeans have been over in the Americas a very long time. And that would make sense why the bloodline of the other black indigenous folks, a.k.a. Indians, why there was so much into mingling and marrying. It would make sense why black Americans carry European surnames. Okay. And they even went as deep as to say, and yeah, these black Europeans became the pioneers of the colonization movement. Willingly or unwillingly. So who was the colonizer? Was it the white man or was it the black man? Let's continue. The latter were at this time lodged in the Savoy, a historical pile in its day. Stripe quaintly described it as a very great and very ruinous building in the midst of a very spacious hall divided into several parts, which to serve as martial seas for keeping prisoners, deserters, men pressed for military service, and Dutch recruiters, ETC. This ruinous building was a sanctuary in 1696, and anyone trying to get hold of debtors there would be tarred and feathered. The Savoy building was set up in 1245, and the last vestige of it was swept away in forming the approaches to the Waterloo Bridge. Okay, so those of you over in um, Europe, uh, uh, European cousins now, I know y'all know where this is located. There were many deserters from the army, some of whom were executed, but those sent by the War Department to the, to the Savoy were destined for exportation to the West Indies. Monroca, Gibraltar, and the plantations. Okay, so the West Indies, so the Caribbeans, what we call uh, the American Caribbeans today, and then uh, other parts of Europe, because Gibraltar is uh, still like a fort over in Europe, and the plantations, okay? So I'm assuming that's the American plantations. What gave the transportation idea a forward impulse was the craze for colonial expansion, which created the need for soldiers to fight the French in foreign parts and if possible, to wrest from them their possessions. 
Lord Starr, the commander in chief, writing on the 14th, June, 1745, said, I think we may expect here directly that we are masters of Lewisburg and the islands of Cape Breton, an important place for fishing, fur trade, and lumber trade. Okay, so they're talking about over in um, what we're calling today the Caribbean. When captured, the place was garrisoned by force under the command of the governor of Massachusetts Bay, and the magistrates had power to grant land to settlers. On June 24th, 1746, the governor, W. Pepper Braille, afterwards cr created a baronet and whose authority ranged over a large tract of country, writing from Boston, gave a suggestion for the employment of Jacobite prisoners. He thus expressed himself to the Duke of Newcastle. Could it be thought expedient the 200 of the rebel prisoners who may have been unrarely seduced should be sent over for Mr. Shirley and my regiment? It might be a means of making good subjects of them, which I mean to your grace with all submission. Pepperell's regiment in garrison at Lewisburg was 417 strong and Shirley's 517, and these regiments were only at half strength. The garrison consisted of 2,500 men, and the governor reported that the soldiers were dying fast and with fluxes, eight or ten a day. The water was bad and the weather severe. Lewisburg was thus poetically described by its governor as he remarked in the words of the poet, in case he got false credit for the couplet. All right. Okay, so that should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, they're telling you how the Jacobites that were sent over to the Caribbean, what we're calling the Caribbeans today, uh, they were in a war uh, on behalf of the Brits against the French, and they were trying to ship some of those Jacobites to... Um, what was it, Massachusetts? Okay. All right. So on the October 6, 1747, the War Department offered a pardon to rebels who would enlist into the independent companies of Admiral Boscoin Expedition. It is a curious circumstance that while rebellious Scotland was thus supplying the colonies with troops, the colony of Georgia had previously sent a regiment to Scotland to help in suppressing the rebellion there. So, chow, 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 chow. Clutch pearls, clutch pearls, clutch pearls, sip tea. Clutch pearls again, sip on some additional tea. So, we are going to just go over that just for grants a little bit. So, you means to tell me. We already know that they were shipping prisoners of war and all of that jazz, folks that were sentenced from Europe over to the Americas, so rather not you hit the um, East Coast, 13 colonies, or rather not you were being shipped over to, back then they were calling it the West Indies, today we call it the Caribbeans, okay? So in the colony of Georgia, you telling me that they sent Regiment to Scotland to help with some fighting over there. So when you hear people talk about this, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, our people went back and forth from here to there. 
you know, but uh, we're the original bloodline, this, that, and the third. We're the original bloodline of the Americas, four, five, six, and seven. And, you know, we was over here, then we went over there, then we came back over here. Uh, well, blood, according to the records, all right. Now, this is just one case, all right. And this particular incident up out of Georgia, now they, they sent their European, their black European troops over to Scotland to help with a rebellion. Okay? So they didn't send indigenous the black Indians over there. They sent indigenous black Europeans that had made their way over to uh, the Americas, whether or not by a prison sentence, whatever the case may be. They sent them back over there to fight this particular battle. All right. So on uh, July 1st, I'm sorry, uh, July 31st, 1746, five weeks after Governor Pepperell's appeal for soldiers from the Jacobite sources. So can't get no clearer than that. From the Jacobite sources, you know, uh, the, the, the Jacobites from Europe, the black Jacobites from Europe. So they're clear on the sources of the soldiers. Application was made for rebel prisoners being sent as recruits for regiments serving in North America and West Indies as follows. Leeward Islands, 250, okay? So these are more folks coming over to the Americas. Leeward Islands, 250. Jamaica, 100. Cape Britain, 400 in all, 750. On the same um, year, L Lieutenant Governor St. Clair and Ad were Admiral Lee Stock were ordered to take prisoners to Lewisburg or failing that, to such other places as was best for the services, okay? So basically, they were um, taking prisoners from here, still black European prisoners back over there to fight. So they even specifically said where they were taking them from, okay? So some up out of Georgia and um, the others up out of the Caribbeans, okay? And they were taking them over to Lewisburg. Another curious feature in connection with the colony was the War Department's intelligence contained in their records that the Nova Scotians, so our Canadian fam, that the Nova Scotians threatened a revolt on a report of the rebellion in Scotland. The child colony, the child colony not yet out of its long clothes, would have liked to be independent of the mother country, at least the French, at least the French section would, who knew Nova Scotia under its Gallic and poetic name of Arcadie, and the occasions presented itself when England was taxed in suppressing the Jacobite rising. The contract for transporting the prisoners was given to Mears. Gildart and Smith, Catington, Street, London, and Mr. and Child. It got really, really hard to read this this part. So I gotta skip around. Um, I couldn't get that. Okay, I gotta skip through it because it, it got blurred when they were copying these transfer transcript, it got blurred. Okay, so they have a letter from some secretary um to the governors of leeward um so i see uh barbados jamaica maryland and virginia um the process to give contractors over the rebels all right so they're talking about taking prisoners from these particular areas uh the caribbeans barbados jamaica and then in the colonies, Maryland and Virginia. Okay, so so uh, a sharp, Mr. Sharp, solicitor to the Treasury, who was appealed to it in the matter, says, 
Unless my memory greatly fails me, letters of the same kind were wrote by my Lord Townshead to the governors of the plantation in 1715. Accordingly, letters were pronounced, promised, I'm sorry, on um, the 26th of March, 1747, to be, to be sent to the various governors named regarding the powers of the contractors and stating that the prisoners were transported for the term of their natural lives and that they must enter into indentures. If they refused to do so, they were to be treated as if they had a significant military guard and was to be placed over them. The first record of transportation in this rebellion was a 47 rebel shipped at Liverpool on 26th of April, 1746 for the plantations. They were transported to Monterey in June, but two died on the passage. Okay. All right. So again, they talking about another uh, uprising. Just to summarize, it was so hard for me to read because part of this was blurred. So again, they're summarizing again, another contract to transport these prisoners. All right. And so um, they're saying to where? Oh, child, they even got St. Lucia in here too, y'all. Uh, no, that may not. Don't quote me on that because it's so blurred. I don't want you to quote me on that. But anyhow, transported to um, Barbados, Leeward Island, Barbados, Jamaica, Maryland, and Virginia. Okay? All right. So this, the next one I'm going to go over is just um, an account on the capturing. Uh, you know, it, it was like gang warfare territory out on them seas. So this particular chapter, we're on page 47, talks about the capture of sh ship with transported rebels, list and description of them, their fate. All right. Now, I know y'all probably saying this child ain't got to the black folks yet. I'm getting there, doggone it. <laughs> so this is saying uh, Scotland, all the rest are safe arrives at Barbados, Jamaica and Virginia. I desire to know when I am to have the care of those who remain at Carlisle, York, Southwark, and elsewhere. In a postscript is added something as to the attempt to find the Northwest Passage. The ships we sent out in the search of the Northwest Passage are returned without having completed the discovery, but have brought us a greater probability than ever. All right. Okay, so they was just saying how... Um, in this particular thing, how some of the ships was getting uh, jacked or they wasn't getting um, back, you know, no message that folks had got there safely, whatever the case may be. All right. But I just wanted to not only just bring that up, that you did have warfare uh, or, you know, as we say today, somebody hitting a lick <laughs> on these voyages. Um, but also the fact that, again, you have document, eyewitness accounts in all of the third and, and the records of folks being brought from Europe to Barbados, Jamaica, Virginia, say to the Americas. So an exact list, an exact List and description of 150 res uh, rebel prisoners shipped at Liverpool on board the veteran John Rickey, master of Leeward Islands, which was taken near Antigua on the 28th of June last by the Diamond Privateer Paul Marcel, commander and carried into Martinico. Uh, on June 30th, 1747. So let's get to this description. All right. You can see here, clear as day. The name, the age, 
the profession. So that lets you know when these black Europeans came over to the Americas, they already had a profession. They tell you uh, the county, they height. And in the comment slash remarks session, brown, okay? Black, curly haired, black complected, black ruddy, black ruddy, brown, ruddy, black, brown, black, brown, black, brown, black, thin, pale, and sickly. Now, this person could have been Caucasian. I'm only basing that on the little pale description. Black, brown, black, black. Brown, brown. Black. Child, they talk about people like, they could be talking about folks up in the description. Black, short necked. <laughs> they wrong. Y'all see this Donald McDonald on here? We talked about this McDonald's surname. I also want y'all to pay attention to these surnames. You got Campbell's surnames on here. Okay. Remember that Campbell's surname is a very powerful surname in Europe. That Campbell's surname held a lot of territory over in the Highlanders. Okay. We got that from uh, Lee Cummings' information. All right, which he also provided receipts on ship manifests. Okay, so we got a lot of McDon uh, McDonald's on here as well. Remember McDougal? That's also a part of this McAlpine or McAlpine bloodline. Okay, so again, but black. This one had red hair, black. Um, and you could just go through the rest of this. You got, um, sandy hair, swathy. Okay. So let's not get it twisted. Just cause somebody got some red hair. Don't mean you Caucasian. Just cause somebody got some brown hair. Here goes sandy hair, but they're swathy. Brown, black, swathy. Uh, and you could just see the descriptions. Okay, there's another pale that could be a Caucasian person. But as you go through this list, you see that, remember, these are the Jacobites. This is the transportation list in 1745 of the Jacobites. They are overwhelmingly majority black aka melanated right so here's the other list just to show you more black and brown okay this could just be a copy of the other list yeah because I see that pale person on there also let me just make sure okay I should have gave y'all a picture of um snapshot of the book uh because it has one two three like three and a half pages in the book of the transportation list and they are overwhelmingly black and brown okay i think i only saw two maybe three listed as pale which i can assume means white on this list. Okay. All right. So the list is taken from three different goal of uh, gowls, Lincoln, York, and Lancaster. And it is likely that the first 46 prisoners who names are all alphabetically arranged would come from Lincoln. 
Now, I want you all to be clear. Let me just uh, let me just go back to this list. Those of you <coughs> in the Americas, and that is com- including the Caribbean islands, that is including Canada, you're carrying these European surnames. Do you see this transportation list? Those names are not from white slave masters. They are from black Europeans. Adams, Brown, Bell, Black, Campbell, Brown, Kachacha, Black, Campbell, Brown again, Davison, Ruddy, Edwards, Black, Goodbrand, Black, Grant, Black, and you have a a grant that was brown. Okay? Now, you do have a McPherson up in here that's described as pale. McIntosh, black. But then you have a McPherson described here as black. Okay? Look at these surnames. McGill, McGillis, Black, McDonald, Black, McDougal, Black, M. Donald, Laborer, Black. Well, it says light hair, fair, well made. Okay? Look at these surnames. There go a Ross. There go a Ross. The Ross tied to the stewards. You know that Ross, Harriet Tubman, Ross, Steward, Black. Her folks showed up on the ship manifest as Black. Here go another Ross showing up as Swarthy, Black. Robertson, Brown. A steward, Ruddy. Okay, that's ditto. D-O is ditto, so brown. Look at these surnames. Steward, brown, well-made, swathy. Thompson, black. Look at these surnames. A lot of you, not a lot of you, uh, pretty much all of who they're classifying as African-Americans, you hold these surnames. But yet in 1745, we see just one example. This is just one example of a transportation list of Jacobites. So now you should know overwhelmingly that the Jacobites were black. Jacobite rebels being exiled out of Europe to the American colonies, their description is black and brown. All right. So uh, let's see here what we're talking about. Okay, so um, basically they're saying that they came out of uh, Lincoln, York, and Lancaster. And they said out of the 135, 18 hail from Perthshire, 20 from Inverness, 25 from Aberdeen, 19 from England, and one from Ireland. So they have records, family. This stuff is documented. That is why when you're doing your genealogy, you hit that wall in the 1700s, you got that surname of that ancestor, go Check the convent uh, records, the immigration records. More than likely, you're going to find your people there. As to the trades represented, 55 were laborers. I'm telling you, it's well documented. 55 were laborers, 11 servants, 20 weavers, 4 herdsmen, 2 gentlemen, vice versa. Number 105, John McKenzie, 22. Ross Shire, well-made, genteel, 
And number 111, John Osler, 20, Lincoln's brown hair, hair genteel. There were, was an Edinburgh writer, George Hume, age 30, Mark S., a black man whose color would no doubt fit suit to the West Indies. It was very well documented. Okay? One man, number 104, a laborer is noted as having his own hair. Chow. A wig. <laughs> I laughed the first time I read this, Chow. A wig was hardly to, uh, to be expected from one of his class or his age, and he was only 32. Then there is a fiddler from Inverness of but 16 years and five, ooh, he was short, five and a quarter feet in height, who is happily characterized, uh, characterized as sprightly, so upbeat, whatever. The following other occupations were represented. Sailor, watchmaker, carp carpenter, whitesmith, peddler, tallow chandler, uh, hooser, Mouser, uh, shoemaker, baker, bookbinder, flax dresser, nail maker, glover, gardener, cook, tailor, husbandman, plowboy, cohert, cord wainer, and last but not least, two barbers. Now, you know what, y'all? I hit the floor when I saw the two barbers up in here. I said, you know what? I can't with them. Okay? So you mean to tell me these black men, like, I got to have my faves together. So I know the two barbers, I just, I just, that just tip, tickled me. That, that just tickles me because you black men and your barbers, I mean, I understand, don't get me wrong. I just, that just straight tickled me that you had uh, two barbers on a little ship. <laughs> okay. So everything was detailed out, family. It was detailed. It was well documented. These prisoners came over with an occupation. But that's not what they teach you in the transatlantic slave trade, right? That they had to be taught these things. But yet these people came over, they already had an occupation. Okay? And I know the barbers, I know they made some change, baby. I know they made some change cutting up them, um, those fades, making sure the brother's hair was fresh. That still tickles me, it really does, okay? They put down, you know, the way they looked. It was very well documented. So the island of Martinico or Martinique, into which the prisoners were carried was in French possession, though taken from the French 15 years later by Admiral Rodney, to whom its Governor General de la Touche capulated. It was the chief of all Leeward Islands owned by the French and was the residence of the ruler of the French settlements in the West Indies. It was quite typical of the other islands in its character and products. Its exports were sugar, cotton, cocoa, aloes, coffee, cassia, etc. And the climate was more adapted to blacks than whites. The island was recently the scene of a terrible, disastrous volcano. Dis disturbance which came su suddenly with appalling and devastating destructions to life and property in 1747 it was sally port for french privateers in the west indies seas uh just as the island of uh, barbon was to french pirates in the indian ocean so in other words when that volcanic uh, disruption took place uh, you had uh Pi uh, pirates coming in, you know, uh, taking stuff. 
As the article of the 1762 capulation make no reference to the 150 prisoners in course of transportation, it is presumed that they had previously quitted the island. The captured vessel was duly claimed from the French in January 1748, but they preemptorily declared to hand it over or the prisoners to the British government. They were then asked to include the latter in the next cartel for the exchange of prisoners, and again they refused to enter in, in, into any engagement, implying the return of the unfortunate to the English servitude. So in other words, they captured the ship this, that, and the other, and then uh, I guess they negotiated between the French and the English, and the French turned back over. What the fate of these prisoners the twice taken captors ultimately was does not transpire from the official papers. Let us hope they achieve their li liberty and return to their native land in happier times. Okay. All right. So, uh, we're going to keep it cracking. Okay. So, uh, we get into the next chapter, chapter five, and, uh, it's really just, um, talking about how um, efforts to transport Jacobite officers, list of transported rebels, the colonist movement fed by deportation of crim criminals, the Lord Justice Clerk watching rebels doing and doings in Scotland. Okay, so pretty much in uh, this particular chapter, they also give an account of um, 68 who were shipped up out, uh, 68 Jacobites who were shipped up out of Europe. And this was on uh, March 30th of 1747, and it was 270 of them. All right. And uh, 183 was from Tilbury Fort, 76 transports on the river, and 11 from Southwark. Uh, okay, so it says a computation was made in the prints of the period that at the beginnings of April of that year, upwards to 600 had been shipped. On the 24th of April, 148 were sent from Carlisle, and about the same time, 68 who had cast lots in Newcastle. So in other words, who had been um, sentenced to be shipped out. Or so if you look at this uh, list of names, it's, uh, I just give you a couple of the surnames. You have a uh, William Murray, you have a uh, Thomas Ross, you have a uh, John Stewart, uh, Elizabeth McFarlane, a uh, uh, John Johnston, Charles Morgan, uh, Alan McDougal, uh, another Campbell on here, another McDonald, a couple of Campbells on here, a couple of Rosses on here, a couple of McDonalds, uh, McGillis. Uh, let me see. Okay, and so uh, just just to give you just a high level of some of those names. These were all to sail from Liverpool for Americas, right? On October 4th, 1747, 38 rebels at Carlisle Castle and 37 at York Castle who were reported to be fit for service as soldiers set out from the last place for London under the strong guard. Their ultimate destination was the East Indies. Okay. All right. So again, and then it also just goes on to say that they were to serve under Admiral Boscawin, who sent a mounted officers of the independent company to take charge of them. Okay. Right. So now we're on page 58. <clears throat> the government were so desirous to get soldiers to help in the reduction of Canada that they had offered in June 1746 a bounty of 30 pounds to be paid in bills of credit, a share in the plunder obtained from the French, also a blanket to each man and a bed for every two men. 
These were the inducements held out to volunteers and publicly advertised in the Gazette. Attempts were also made to enlist as many rebels as possible, though without using direct comp uh, compulsion. It was tried in a more insidious way. In July 1748, William Barclay and 72 others were pardoned on condition of their enlisting themselves into his majesty's service to go abroad. Okay, so Barclay is one of them names. Got to put on that list to dig a little deeper into that, in that heritage on how they connect to the uh, Americas. It is probable that somewhat more than one third of all prisoners would enter the army for foreign duty, right? So here again, they're giving you account of uh, how the Jacobite rebellion folks got over to the Americas. And in this case, um, they're pretty much volunteered. Either they were volunteered, so getting some payoffs, or they were pardoned on the conditions that they go into the military, specifically the military to serve over to the American colonies. Transportation of criminals acted also as a great feeder of colonization. Okay, again, they just keep mentioning this. They keep telling you where the labor came from in the colonies, in the Americas, and the plantations. It did not come from an, uh, an African slave trade. Two cha uh, Chapman for fraudulent bankruptcy at Glasgow in July 1748 were ordered to be uh, pillared and to be transported to America for seven years and two sectons whose else work took out of the graveyard and sold 150 lead coffins were similarly sentenced. The colonies thus became a common receptacle for all kinds of characters, bad, good, and indifferent. On the 14th of March, 1749, it was announced that responsive to a notice in the Gazette inserted by the Lord Commissioners, upward of 400 persons had given their names to the Estates and Plantation Office, Whitehall to go to Nova Scotia. To take volunteer colonists abroad, more than 50 transports were contracted for by the government which would probably mean 10,000 immigrants at 200 persons for each transport. Okay, so they're talking about the volunteers. So these are the immigrants. As the war with France had come to a close with the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle in October 1748, many old soldiers would not hesitate to go abroad. In allusions to gall birds and uh, the impunious betaking themselves to the backwoods of Canada, a poet expressed the situation. See distant climates they explore, a rude, uncultivated shore transported by harsh decree from gowls and punery they flee. All right. The transportation of rebels continued to the close of 1748 and portion of 1749 with the ex expulsion of the pretender from France where all hopes lay in December 1748, the English government could afford to exercise more clemency towards political offenders, although to political offenders. Okay, that's all I wanted. All right, so it's really interesting stuff. So the next chapter, six, the contractor's correspondence as to shipping rebels, could the rebellion have been terminated earlier? A pamphlet ordering, I'm sorry, a pamphlet urging clemency to rebels, Mr. Whitfield's contribution to colonization Estimated number of forced immigrants, formation of Highland loyal regiments, disloyalty on the wane, 
instant of personal resentment against witnesses giving evidence, Scottish colonists and their Celtic influence the benefits of transportation. On June 4, 1748, Mr. Smith, the contractor, wrote to the Honorable Thomas Stanhope, enclosing copies of the letters written by Duke of Newcastle and the Secretary of War on the occasion of transporting the rebel prisoners who were not convicted, but who were obtained pardons on condition of serving me or my assigns in the plantation during life which may prevent some trouble to you in making out the necessary paper, papers for transporting the rebel convicts that remain in the goals of Surrey, York, Carlisle, etc. He added that he was desirous to dispatch them without delay as he had several ships fitting out for the colonies and he hoped that the pardon would be framed in such terms as to give him a proper power over their services abroad. So pretty much this Mr. Smith, a contractor, wrote to the judge and said, you know what? As you're handing out those sentences and pardoning folks, can you just sentence them to be, uh, to go to the colonies? We already got transportation lined up this, that, and the fourth or this, that, and the third. <laughs> On the 19th, November, 1748, Mr. Smith, after acknowledging receipt of the warrants for Surrey, sent Mr. Stanhope, thus wrote, by a letter I had yesterday from Liverpool, I am informed that the ship I had engaged to carry the prisoners from York and Carlisle to Jamaica. So again, this is very well documented. So from York and Carlisle to Jamaica was clear to sail and my limited day for having them at the water side elapsed. Therefore, as there is a risk of a disappointment for a little time, I must request that the favor you will write to the messenger that sent you to Carlisle and York in order to remain at these places until my agent, Mr. George Campbell at Liverpool, equates them then the other ships will be ready which he is providing so in other words you know the first uh deadline that i had to be parked here with this ship that didn't already pass so can you just authorize uh me again to sit here a little longer until we can get those prisoners on board to be shipped over to the americas and in this case this ship was going to Jamaica. Mr. Smith, uh, Cateton Street had a poor opinion of the rebel conflict convicts rather over whom he desired to have the power which chains and slavery confer. His aim was, of course, to make money at their expense, first by shipping them and next by letting them out to planters and others. The opinions entertained by Mr. Smith of these poor Highlanders were also held by Scotsmen. Lord Ray thus stigmatized them, these idle, ignorant people, and the Lord Justice Clerk so expressed himself to the Secretary of State in November 1752. The miserable inhabitants of these wild that here, here hitherto have been generally a terror to their neighbors and animals of prey ready upon every occasion to ruffle the tranquility of the government may at last be brought to apply themselves to industry and become good subjects and useful citizens. So in other words, he wanted to put them into a slavery position and rent their labor out. Okay. But again, these aren't African slaves. These are black Europeans. The student of these times asked himself if the rebellion could at any stage have been brought to an end without the, necess the necessity for bloodshed, bloodshed or its alternative banishment. Um, here go a McDonald, y'all. 
Ennis McDonald, one of the intellectuals, so now y'all should understand that McDonald name, ties back to McAlpine or McAlpine dynasty, okay? Who was the Moorish Pittish king who established the reign of power in Scotland, okay? So you all need to understand these surnames. So Ennis McDonald, one of the intellectual adherents of the prince, so that should make sense. While um, McDonald had ties with the prince, okay, because he's of a certain bloodline, and who had both a French and Scottish connection. Well, we know what the Scott connection is, right? Because his ancestor was the one that united that, well, what they call united, conquered and established the Scottish kingdom, all right? So, uh, so he had both French and Scottish connection, made a remark on the subject in the course of his examination, which is of much interest. He said that if Marshall Wade's proclamation had, without exception, pardoned all who were engaged, Upon their returning quietly home and laying down their arms, he knew very well that two-thirds of the rebels would have dispersed. But the proclamation accepting the gentry and chiefs, they found themselves under the necessity of continuing with the pretender's son for their own preservation. So in other words, you know, some of them were coerced into being in Jacobite rebels okay that's pretty much what uh he was saying okay so this is the interesting part <clears throat> we're at um page 62 there may be mentioned in an interesting contribution to colonization in south carolina the founding there by mr whitfield the famous preacher now, child, this, I'm like, child, a T to T to T. Mr. Whitfield, the famous preacher of an orphan home, 70 miles from Charleston, on a plantation of 660 acres of good land. In a sermon preached at Edinburgh in September 1748, an account was given of the progress of the institution. There were also schemes ventilated for sending out debtors to America and giving them their discharge or deportation. Okay, so before we go into that part, did y'all peep game of the orphan homes that were set up in the Americas? And this one was set specifically on a plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. And not only that, we now know who those orphans were. They were not African slaves. They were black European children. Okay. All right. So then that now the other um, folks that was in debt, you going to be sent over to the Americas too. For many years until the American war, a stream of criminals, though not of the worst type, these were hanged, flawed in America, and fertilized its land by the humble agency of manual labor, which Adam S Smith has shown to be the foundation of all material prosperity. So I want y'all to peep game, because that, that's, that's a very powerful statement, fam. That's very powerful. So even when you're doing your genealogy, if you find your folks on that criminal record on a criminal record on the criminal um convict list do not think that you know they was out there robbing stealing and and harming people they literally said that um a stream of criminals though not of the worst type these were hanged and flogged so in other words they got taken out Okay, so your folks fit into the cat category either it was a, 
a debt sentence. They had too much debt they couldn't pay back. They were sent over here. Or you fought in some type of rebellion and was kicked out. Okay? Those are the people that came over. All right? And you did have some that was uh, hitting some licks or, you know, stealing stuff and they sent over here as well. But they said, what did they come over here to do? Manual labor, which is which has shown to be the foundation of all material prosperity. Okay, so uh, melanated people, only confusion that you have in the game is that you are descendants of an African slave. If that's the case, you should be able to find the records. But when you state you are an American, and your family and your ancestors built this country, you can wholeheartedly say that. So whether or not your bloodline is all the way predominantly Black European, or whether or not you have an admixture such as myself, a Black European and Black Indian, or whether or not you're all the way Indian, which, okay, you know, that's rare, but okay. If that's your story, that's your story. Either way, as a black American, we did build this country. Make no mistakes about it. We, our ancestors, literally built this country. It is stated in the report of the Royal Histori Historical MSS commissioned that between the years 1717 and 1775, no less than 2,000 forced immigrations, immigrants rather, were dispatched from the Old Bailey alone, while 50,000 are estimated to, be, to have been sent from the British islands in the 17th and 18th centuries. Okay, so he's giving you totals from 1717 to 1775, 50,000. So even in just this time period, that's still not millions of folks. That's still not millions of Africans. That's not even still millions of Europeans. So the 1600s through the 1700s, we can assume, even if you want to put that number at, let's say, 500,000. That's still not millions of folks. So where are the millions of black slaves they're talking about? Who are they? Well, they had to be the indigenous black Indian slaves that made up majority of the population, with the other majority being the black Europeans. Okay? All right. So, um, so it says, uh, while 50,000 are estimated to have been sent from the British islands in the 17th and 18th century In 1766, judge Perot said at the Stanford Assises, the transportation in the case of common offenders had almost ceased to be punishment. The Celtic element among the immigrants proved loyal when the American war broke out. For the Highland colonists formed themselves into the Royal Highland Immigrant Re Regiment. Okay, so we should now understand once uh, the uh, the um, American War broke out, you should understand why folks were siding up the way they were siding up. Okay, all right. And what you should understand, black melanated people, that those wars fought, all of them, they were fought by black folk. All right? So the French and Indian Wars, all of them other in Indian war, wars, the Bacon Rebellion, uh, shoot, I know I'm missing a bunch of them. The American Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Desert Storm. If you do your genealogy, you're going to find your people fought in a lot of those wars. 
including the American Revolutionary War. I know I found my one of my folks on here. And they were listed as black. Okay. All right. So uh, it was then that the genius of Mr. Pitt, afterwards known as Lord Chatham, showed itself in recommending his sovereign, George II, in 1756 to employ the Highlanders on military service as the surest means of securing their loyalty and attaching them to his person and throne. This advice was accepted, and accordingly, orders were issued for raising Highland regiments a battalion was formed of McDonald's. Y'all should know where that McDonald's surname come from. Frasers, McLean's, Fargenharsons, and Camerons. The chiefs of these clans, are you peeping game? The chief of these clans receiving commissions and their clansmen acted as the rank and file. Okay. So pretty, pretty interesting stuff, fam. Um, sorry, we had to check something. Okay, pretty, pretty interesting stuff, fam. So we're in the home stretch of it now. Uh, this is on page 66. Reverting to the transported prisoners, there are no statistics as to the rate of mortality of these in the various colonies and plantations to which they were sent. Okay, now I'm telling y'all that the statistics of those that were sent in the colonies, uh, those that survived, um, you know, if you were enlisted, your folks were enlisted on the quote, quote, American side of the of the uh, American Revolutionary War, your then your ancestor was documented. Okay, if your ancestors from Europe, um, you can also find them in in the American census records. Okay. So what they're saying here is they don't know if they came over here and blended in, got married, this, that, and the third, or if, you know, they, they just uh, lost their life, right? So uh, the rate of mortality of these in the various colonies and plantations to which they were sent, Bishop Hay in his Jacobite memoirs tell of 81 Highlanders who were tempted to submit in, in Vernus and were thereupon placed on the board the king's vessel and subjected to wretched treatment in them. Those who arrived were sent to Barbados, where only 18 were alive three years after out of 41. John Fisk in the old Virginia and her neighbors rather delight in the circumstances that many Scottish prisoners became colonists in America, let me run that for the slow ones in the back. Because remember, we're talking about in history, they tell you this transatlantic slave trade and you have, you know, white massa overseers. But yet here we are clearly reading the account and the receipts of these Jacobites men and those before them are black folk. Okay. So here it says that um, in his old Virginia and her neighbors rather delights in the circumstances that many Scottish prisoners became colonists in America, 150 having been sent to Boston and 1670, uh, 1,670 to Virginia in the year 1650 by Cromwell, who captured them at Dunbar. The rising of 1715 was responsible for the deportation of about 1,000 and the rebellion of 1745 for probably about 1,600. It forced soldiers and indentured servants or indentured prisoners to be taken together. As to 
the latter period, Fisk says, later on in 1745, after the suppression of the Jacobite rebellion, there came to North Carolina a powerful reinforcement of Scott Highlanders, among them many of the clan McDonald. Y'all should already know. Uh, just, just another just quick recap of that McDonald clan uh, from Kenneth McAlpine. Okay. That's that's the McDonald clan. Donald, okay. Black folk. All right. So the Highlanders, among them, many of the clan McDonald included the romantic Flora McDonald, who had done so much for the young fugitive prince. At the present time, there are in the Carolinas large numbers of natives of Highland descent, and the Gaelic language is still spoken in a few places. Okay, so this was the late 1700s, fam. They were still speaking in, in the Carolinas, those Highlanders, their Gaelic language. So I, I find it chuckling that folks that want to speak of their African heritage want to ask people that say that their bloodline is indigenous to the land, i.e. American Indian, what language do you speak? Uh, okay, so what language do you speak, African? And see, we just know, based on their story, they can't tell us any of where any of their heritage comes from, from an African perspective. They can't give any specifics. They can't even give you a specific time frame their, their uh, ancestors came to this land, on what plantation their ancestors served on. Why can't you give us any language? So we already know more than likely if they took the time to do their heritage, their personal heritage, instead of worrying about what somebody else's heritage is, we already know that they're probably going to find black European. Okay. So even in black European uh, perspective, if you were a Highlander during this time, they were speaking their own language. In conclusion, painful though it was at the time to the Jacobite, men and women deported and to their friends, candor compels the avowal that transportation was on the whole what Sir George Mackenzie claimed for it, an act of clemency. It was of the benefit to the state since it gave impetus to colonization Okay, not slavery, let's be clear. Not the transatlantic African slavery, okay? It was the exiling of black Europeans that served colonization. It told of lands beyond the sea waiting for the hand of man to cultivate. It placed on soils now bursting with tropic heat, now bound with Arctic cold, a class of men not only fit to work them, but strong to defend them. It opened up the tutor or the untutored object of transportation. According to his sense of perspective, a big or small visit of imperialistic possibilities and enlarged his mental horizon. In not a few cases, it converted him from a servant into a master it even provided a living to many who were destitute. And last but not least, it transformed, as by the touch of an alchemist, a body of disaffected rebels into ardent loyalists and peaceful colonists in regions far remote from their native land, by which they now called home. Wow, family. There you have it, the Black Jacobites from Jacob Jacobite Gleaning, from state manuscripts, short sketches of Jacobites, the transportation in 1745 by J. Macbeth Ford, Forbes. So I want to send a shout out again to Brother Knowledge of Self uh, for dropping this source. Very, very, very powerful information. 
So I hope you got something out of this, fam. I hope this gives you even more information and more proof of who was really hitting the hitting these American shores when. I hope black Americans, this give you some insight into doing your genealogy and not guessing or not being told who you are, but actually knowing who you are. Overall, black American story is not the African slave trade. It's not out of shame. It's much, much more richer than we think. So I hope you all got some value out of this. Um, I'm probably going to circle back and go through this again and see if I can uh, connect some dots with uh, some of those majors and generals from Europe, connect the dots on that bloodline making it over to the Americas. A uh, very, very great um, body of work, this particular manuscript. I got so, so, so much out of it. And shout out to all the other researchers and content creators that uh, put this information out, the true history. You put your time, you spend your money uh, slash resources to put this information out. It's very important. So I wish everyone well on this Monday. This is Rhonda with WTUZ Radio Podcast. Peace and love, family. What? <laughs>